The title of my talk, as you I hope can see, is that, well, ORCO R, and it's really about new developments on OR, OR. So I should explain that move, things have happened during the lockdown period, because normally during uh, most of my time, I would be gadding about the world ruining my uh, carbon footprint and so on or at least enhancing it, I suppose, which is the wrong way around. And uh, unable to do this, I was able to think about things which I'd been sort of leaving aside for a long time. And uh, I thought it was worth thinking about more about the or R part, that is to say physics. And uh, I want to talk about some of the things that I've come upon since the beginning of lockdown, which are basically new. Um, not all to do with the gravitational uh, reduction of the state. I should explain what OR is, and I hope you can read the bottom of this picture. Is that, can that be read? What I want to say is yes, that OR that. stands for the objective reduction of the quantum state. And of course, the acronym OR says one or the other, rather than a superposition of the two. Because quantum mechanics just leads, leads to these more and more messed up superpositions, and you don't resolve out one thing or another. People often say that quantum mechanics is the most wonderful theory we've ever, ever had in physics. The trouble with it is that it's self-inconsistent theory. And I don't think the most wonderful theory ought to be in, inconsistent with itself. It's self-inconsistent because, well, let's go to the, uh, well, before going to that, yeah, no, let's say about it, a little bit more about or. See, it's self-inconsistent because it consists of two features, the most, uh, Detailed one, if you like, is the Schrodinger equation. This is an equation which tells you how the state of the universe evolves. And the, that Schrodinger equation does not tell you what happens in the world. And now let me say a bit more about that. But before coming to that, I thought I would mention a paper which came out just last week. It came out on Monday in uh, uh, Nature Physics and it's, I don't know, I'll put it up here. I don't know whether the, uh, this is, I hope that's more or less in the middle of the screen there. Um, the paper is about an experiment which has been just done recently about putting a crystal, I forgot whether it's germanium or something, and they try to see whether you get radiation from it. Now, I should explain that there are many theories of OR. They don't necessarily call it OR. The idea is that, well, some people don't worry about the reduction of the state at all. They just go in and do their quantum. And well, I'm talking about people who work in quantum theory. They may uh, not worry about it. They just use the rules and forget about the fact they're self inconsistent. The Schrodinger equation does not have a collapse in it. The collapse is something which has to be introduced outside. There are various proposals for sort of classical ones, that somehow when the environment gets mixed up with the state, then you might as well say that collapse has happened. I should say these arguments are not correct. They're very, very uh, prominent and people somehow believe, okay, well, you don't preserve your quantum state very precisely and the environment gets mixed up with it, then somehow uh, one thing happens or the other. Well, that's not true. It's just that the environment gets entangled with the one thing and with the other and it's just a, such a mess that, uh, there is a procedure which people adopt often, which is a bit of magic. I mean, you wave your hands around. It's not a consistent procedure. And it doesn't really explain why one thing happens or the other. There are other models like many worlds, as we had earlier mentioned today, uh, which means that all these things do happen all at once. So that doesn't really explain why we don't experience more than one thing. So it means in a sense that one's consciousness maybe follows one of these, but then why does, why does somebody else's consciousness follow the same thing? Or do I lose all my friends because they've all gone different, down different tracks? Now, I've never, I should say, it's probably a stage in life in physics which you go through. There was a time when I went through this stage. I don't remember how many weeks it lasted, but I certainly did contemplate the idea of a many worlds picture before coming to the conclusion that really we need something much more drastic than that. It doesn't explain anything. Um, okay. Now, among those people who think th something should be done about it, there are very, well, broad categories of theory. Um, and most of these involve 
um, either heating. See, if you have an object, let me just explain it. I, this is a, an article I, I didn't want really to go into, and I hope you don't see it very clearly because, well, I'm, you won't be able to see the small print. But it's basically disproving what they call the, uh, the Deoshi Penrose model. And uh, they come to a conclusion that the Deoshi Penrose model ought, well, you see, here's the second page of this article, and at the top, there's a sort of cartoon of what happens. You have a, an atom in one place, superposed with an atom in another place, and the sum of those is what happens. They're both at once. And the idea is that if you have any theory which collapses the state, it becomes one or the other, then you sort of jump from this state to that, and this jump is a sort of, it causes heat because you have some motion. It, and if you have a jump in your system, then it's likely that you would expect, well, things get jiggled around and so it pr provides heat. Or in this case, what they're studying is it produces radiation. And so they went, considered putting these crystals down a mine to see whether they actually radiate. Down a mine because there's all sorts of other radiation going on and they want to shield all that out just to make sure that they see this particular radiation. They don't see anything. And so they conclude this is a disproof of this model. It probably is a disproof of this model, but it's not my model, even though it has my name attached to it. I should explain why it has my name attached to it, because the criterion that this Hungarian physicist Dioshi put forward several years before I did, which is a proposal for the rate at which the reduction takes place. And it has to do with if you have a superposition between two states, here we have a, something in one place and something in the other, and you look at the difference between this mass distribution and that one, and you look at the gravitational self-energy of that, and the reciprocal of that is the rate of decay. And that formula is the same as one I used. I came about it from quite a different direction, but that is the same formula. So that's why they link our names. But in my model, and I'm going to try and explain it because it's, it's, it's a bit outrageous what I want to say, but then quantum mechanics is outrageous and the reduction of the quantum state is pretty outrageous. So you need something, I think, fairly outrageous to explain what's going on. And it's more outrageous than I expected at first. But the, a lot of things I want to say are not specific to my model. They apply to other models like this. Well, this one, yeah, I'll say that. It does apply to it in a sense. Let me, before going to that, say just something about quantum mechanics as it's normally used. And here we have Schrodinger's equation written at the top. The main point about it, which I want to make, is it's a linear equation. You just have a derivative and you've got psi on both sides. Psi is the quantum state. And it's because, uh, well, you have a, the Hamiltonian, which is a linear operator. Everything is linear. What does linear mean? Well, you see, if you have one solution of the equation, you call it psi. Usually this letter is used for the wave function. If you have one solution, and if you have another solution, we we'll call phi, then any linear combination, alpha psi plus beta phi, is also a solution. That's the whole point of linearity. Alpha is a constant, beta is a constant. These are complex numbers, and they are related to when you make a measurement. If you make a measurement to ask the question, is it A or is it B, or is it alpha, or is it, is it psi, or is it phi, you should say, then the squared modulus of these numbers give you the relative probability. So that's the Born rule. Now, the problem with linearity, as Schrodinger was very clear to point out, people often point to the Schrodinger's cat and say, well, if you had a really elaborate experiment, you could put a, a cat in the state that was alive and dead at the same time, and isn't that wonderful? Schrodinger was really pointing out the absurdity of, of his own equation. To have a state where you have a, a cat which is alive and dead at the same time, he regarded as an absurdity, as I do. Nevertheless, uh, you, it's it's a, a rational conclusion from this linearity. Here I have a a laser, and here we have a beam splitter, that's a half silver mirror, if you like. It, it, it emits a single photon. This single photon goes along, it splits into two, so the photon's location is partly going along here and partly going here. The, the state of the photon is a superposition of these two different routes. This route goes and it fires a gun. I should say that there's a cat at the other side of the room here. If it goes this way, the cat is unharmed, 
If it goes this way, it fires a gun, kills the poor cat, and the state, if the photon is in the state of a linear superposition of these two, which it is, as the photon goes along, its state becomes a linear superposition of here and here. So the reality of the world, if you like, is this together with that on top of each other. This one fires a gun, and therefore, if, you, if the linearity continues right up to this level, then you must have a cat in a state which is alive and dead at the same time. So that is a completely correct conclusion of the formalism. And Schrodinger was basically pointing out that his, the formalism, he's really pointing out a flaw, if you like, in his own theory. He's saying, roughly speaking, my theory can't be right because it predicts such absurdities. People often don't, don't read it that way. Let me, um, I could move things sideways. I'm not sure whether, if I put both together, that can be seen. Um, let me do that if you like. I don't know if you, can you see both of them to, at once or? Yes, we can. Okay. Now I'm going to raise this question. Is, is the state vector, is the, is the wave function, is it real? Now you see, people often say, well, it's not really real. It's something which is, it tells you probabilities. It's really telling you something about the probability of one thing happening or of another thing happening. It's not really probabilities because these numbers, alpha and beta, are not probabilities. They're amplitudes. They're more subtle quantities. You have to take the squared modulus, which is a number, to get the probabilities, the ratios of these squared modulus. But there's more information in it. These, these amplitudes are very subtle quantities and they're not probabilities. They're certainly not probabilities. There's something from which you can get your probabilities if you have a measurement which uh, t distinguishes one from the other, the, the psi state from the phi state. Now, is it real? Now, my eyesight is not good enough to read this down here, but this is a quote from a famous paper by Einstein and co colleagues of what he calls an element of reality. <laughs> What he says, more or less, is that something has an element of reality if you can predict with certainty the result of an experiment which does not disturb the system. So if you have an experiment which you perform on that system and it doesn't disturb the system and it provides the answer yes that you expect with certainty, then there is an element of, to, of reality to be attached to that thing. And I think it's a very good criterion. It has very strange consequences. One of the consequences, however, is that the wave function is real. There's a little confusion of terminology here because real is not, in the mathematical sense, <laughs> the state is a complex thing, not, not real in the real number sense, but real in the sense of reality. Well, in a sense, yes, because there's a theory, always a theoretical experiment you could perform, whether you can actually perform it, there's a theoretical experiment, which could tell you that the state it gives you answer yes if it is in this state with certainty and that's the only state which will give the answer with certainty yes <clears throat> i won't go into that because my arguments don't really depend upon it but i say it does have a kind of reality so i'm going to say that the quantum state is real now i'm going to say something more about this namely this is what one of the things that came about from my worrying about well, in the lockdown, trying to worry about the reduction of the state. There really are two kinds of reality. And this didn't occur to me for quite a long time. The reality here is what we're going to call quantum reality. And I'm calling this Einstein's dictum. If you can, well, let me say the two kinds of reality. In classical reality, you can ask the state of the system, what is your state? And it can say, my state is X. You can go and explore it and measure it and all sorts of things. And yes, it, you can find out what it is. You can find out what its state is. You don't tell it. You don't put to it what its state might be. You say, what is your state? And it says, my state is X. That's classical reality. Many experiments are of that nature. Quantum reality is the Einstein dictum thing. You can't ask what its state is. But what you can do is you can make a little calculation. You think, oh, I think the state by now ought to be x. And then you say, can you confirm whether your state is x? And it says, yes, with certainty. You can repeat the same experiment many, many times. Every time it will come up with the answer, yes. 
So Einstein says, this is a real thing. But the point I'm trying to make, it's a different kind of reality. And I think this is an important point. So I want now to say a little bit about the classical reality here. Let me consider a situation. Like, let me not take that, away, take that away for the moment. I'm going to consider many of my diagrams will be space-time diagrams. This is a space-time diagram. Time is going up the picture. Now I'm considering a lump of an a lump here, and you're hitting it with a beam split photon. So it's not the cat which could be uh, dead or alive. Um, I can find that again. But what it does is if the photon goes one way, it gives the object a little push. If it goes, the, is that the cat? No, I'm looking at the one. I'm afraid I have to apologize. My eyesight is very bad and I can't necessarily see these things. Here we go. Here we have a laser and instead it goes beam split. Instead of firing a gun, it pushes a lump. So if it goes this way, it pushes the lump. If it goes that way, it doesn't. So we have a lump in the superposition of two locations. I'll say a bit more about this later. But here we have a, a history. As time progresses, think is it going up here? The thing is put into a superposition of these two different locations. Now, after a while, it reaches this criterion to say, well, it's likely that it's going to reduce to one or the other. And let's say it does. The dotted line means it's the superposition of these two different histories as time progresses. And then it becomes this one, not that one. So this one disappears. So that is the sort of history of this evolution. Now, the problem I'm raising here is that I'm not a relativistic picture. That is to say, you're trying to consider that simultaneously the lump becomes one over here and not over here. However, let me consider an observer moving at great speed to the left in the picture. And the line here represents simultaneous events. And as that time progresses, that line is tilted with regard to the other line. And so if this one becomes the lump location here, and this one disappears, when you get to this point, the lump is here, there, and partly there, there. And this is a terrible thing, because if it was partly there, it means that if you perform a measurement, there's a 50% chance you might find it here, in which case you'd find it in both places. So that's a nonsense. What about the other? You could consider now the green person's measurement is the other way around. Now the simultaneous lines are this way, and then here's where you reach the problem. This one is still maybe may there, maybe not there. This one is gone. So there's a 50% chance that it might disappear from here, and 50% chance it might disappear. That's absolute nonsense. That's clearly wrong. So it can't be, the picture cannot be correct that somehow it disappears from one location, not from the other. Now you might have a model in which it sort of fades out gradually. It doesn't help. There's even a reason why models where, where, the, where the superposition sort of fades out and it becomes more and more one and less and less the other. And there are, I have a strong argument why that can't work. Um, I'm not going to go into that argument. Uh, I think I'll give a hint as to what it is. And if anybody wants to know, I can talk about it. But what I really want to say is that the, a picture in which it disappears in one place after being uh, in a superposition, then it's totally in the other place, doesn't make relativistic sense. In fact, the only sense seems to me you can make of this picture, which is consistent with relativity, is to trace everything right back to here. So if it disappears here, it's as though the reality was this all the time. Now that's a, an absurd idea, you might think. It's uh, what I call the retroactive perspective. And I have here another picture of that. Perhaps I'll move this over to here. And what I'm saying is that we think now of the space times. Here I've just had these paths in space-time, if you like. But you see, each of these lumps deforms the space-time. So as we go along, here we have at the bottom of the picture, I hope you can see that, a, a laser here, a beam splitter there, the photon goes through, partly here, and partly is displaced out that way. So the photon is in the superposition of coming this way and that way. So when it hits the lump, if it hits the lump, it moves it, it displaces it backwards a little bit. 
but if it doesn't hit it, it doesn't displace it. So the lump is in a superposition of being, well, as, the, as time evolves, it moves a little bit. So here it is in a superposition here and here, superposition here and here. But what we have to bear in mind is that the space-time now becomes a superposition, in a sense, of two slightly different space-times. Now the criterion that Deoshi and I formulated, I can phrase it a different way. And that is that the time up to the collapse, which is here, this is where it becomes one or the other, the, the, the difference between these space times, so that's a four dimensional distance, is one unit in Planck units. Now Planck unit is the unit that you get when you try to combine gravity with quantum mechanics, and you get this absolute unit. And it usually puzzles people because they say if you get to that small distance then space doesn't make sense or something. But this is something rather different. They said that your space-time, it can still be a continuous picture, but when you get a, a superposition, which in space-time terms becomes one unit, then one of them has to drop off. Now, it's just an average time. It doesn't happen exactly then. You have to think of this like an unstable particle, which has a half-life, and this is basically the half-life after which it becomes one or the other. Incidentally, it's slightly, well, I, I, on the right-hand side, I have the quantum reality. Now, the quantum reality preserves both superpositions, so that persists as a superposition. But the classical reality says it's got to be one all the time. So when this thing ch makes its choice, so the choice is made here in a sense, it affects the classical space-time back here. Now, this is what is a sort of outrageous thing to say. It looks as though you're in the future, influencing something in the past. But in a certain sense, I think this is what happens. You have to be careful of all sorts of paradoxes. And I'm worried about this, of course. I worry about paradoxes. Uh, but I think it's safe from paradox. It, uh, it's, it's, um, I should say, I did actually talk about this. I think it was two years ago at a Tucson conference, when right at the end of the conference, I mentioned this sort of idea. I hadn't really thought it through very much, but I did talk about it before. That was the first time that I ever put this particular idea forward. But uh, I've sort of filled it out quite a bit. But, uh, into, and I think we have to think of the quantum reality and the classical reality. There, there's a bit of an irony here, because if you use Einstein's dictum, it doesn't quite give you this, because it would say, does it say with certainty it's this superposition or not? Well, you see, there's a little chance that it might reduce the state. So it's almost certainty, if we're way down here, say, it's almost certain that you're in this superposition, but not quite because it might reduce. So it gives a little bit of fuzziness to the quantum uncertainty, which is fine, but I thought I would mention that point. Now, let me give you another picture. This one I did give before, but it's in color, so you might like to see a colored picture of the same thing. Let's so move that over here and uh, put my colored picture in. Here we have the, oh dear, I've almost dropped something. I think, oh, I've got it, yes. Here we have in color the same thing which is going on here, but it was space time, you see, the lump becomes in. To a superposition of two locations, and then after a little while, that's too much of a strain on the system. One of them has to die, and the other one lives. And this is where the reduction happens. And now I have a, a cartoon of, um, I think it's this way up. Here we have where the OR takes place. So we have objective reduction. This is the moment of proto consciousness. I like to call it proto-consciousness, con not consciousness, because, well, if everything is conscious, you can't even walk down the street without killing something. Uh, and I think uh, proto-consciousness is a safer thing. It's the, proto it's the building block out of which conscious actual consciousness takes place. And it has to be orchestrated in some way, which is a much more subtle problem, I'm sure, to give something which is, we could call genuine um, something that can really feel something in a genuine sense. But in a certain sense, it's the or choice, which maybe gives us so, scope for free will. I've never been quite sure what I thought about free will. Um, and certainly the view is that if you have a, 
deterministic universe like Newtonian picture, or when you introduce Maxwell's equations, it does, it's still deterministic. If you introduce um, Maxwell's demons even, it's still, still deterministic. If you introduce uh, the quantum wave function, you introduce the Schrodinger equation, it's still deterministic. It's not deterministic or something when you have this reduction of the state and maybe that's where one's consciousness actually does come in and makes a decision which goes back in time in some sense. Now, this relates to, in fact, this was the sort of thing which I was worrying about before in the Tucson conference then, was experiments due to Benjamin Libet in the, um, in the late 1900s. And uh, I'll give you a picture of one set of these experiments, which is that, I mean, there are two classes of these experiments. These which involve where you make a movement. So there's the <clears throat> um, active effect of consciousness. I will my hand to move this way. And there's the passive aspect of consciousness when you actually sense something. And there are these experiments which seem to indicate that moving something or other, there's a precursor of that. And, and people worried about this. I was never quite sure about that uh, because I'm never quite clear whether when you actually decide something, the precursor may be gearing yourself up to, to decide something, or I don't know. But the other one is to do with the sensation. And this is also a Libet experiment. And I've got a cartoon of this here. Well, no, this is actually a, not a cartoon, it's a, a picture. I don't want to talk about all these things, but uh, I think let me explain the situation is. There is a stimulus to the hand, and this is, I think, an electrode which is, touches the hand at a certain point. And this is, this is at the same time as this patient is having an operation on the brain for some other reason, and the part of that brain which is concerned with the feeling of that part of the hand being stimulated is being stimulated with an electrode. And it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. I think I'll describe this one particular one here, which is where you first of all stimulate the skin, and then a little bit later, you start to stimulate the brain. Now, if you don't stimulate the brain, the patient thinks that the stimulation of the skin is pretty well similar, simultaneous, the, I mean, it, it takes place at a certain moment and the patient feels it only slightly after that. So it's more or less simultaneously. Whereas if you stimulate that part of the brain up to about half a second later, then the patient doesn't feel the stimulation of the hand. It, it feels the stimulation of the brain, but it can distinguish, the patient can distinguish the difference between those two things. It feels like the skin, but not quite the same. You can say, no, no, it's not what it actually stimulating the skin feels like. I can tell the difference, but it's the same part of the skin that's involved. And if that stimulation takes place after the stimulation of the skin, within, I think, half a second or something, then <clears throat> you don't feel it, the actual stimulation of the skin <clears throat> at all, which is very remarkable. Now, it seems to me, this may tie in with some of the ideas I don't think Stuart mentioned particularly, but he did mention the pyramidal cells. And this may well be, I think he may have said, where the consciousness takes place. Now, you, it takes a while before the, the touching of the skin makes its way up to this part of the brain. And then you've got to, if that's when you become conscious of it, you have to refer it backwards to when you think the stimulation actually took place. Now you see, if you can also create an action, like as in this picture here, which moves your hand or whatever it does, you feel, you feel it up here, but then you start to do something a little bit earlier. You see, I've often worried about this delay that people say, well, you don't feel something till half a second later. And this always seemed to me a little bit strange because if you play ping pong, I used to play ping pong quite a bit, and this is something you, I mean, half, you know, it's got to be much, much less than half a second to do something. You've got to make a decision to do with the ball. And is this entirely unconscious or, or actually are you doing something consciously? It always seemed to me that you're doing something consciously, maybe not be 
It may be pretty well pre-prepared, the kind of thing you might do, but the choice may come a bit later. So it's, it struck me as these things are things which do need explanation, and uh, I don't think um, that, that uh, you can disregard experiments of this nature. How much time do I have left? Well, we're technically a little bit over. Do you think you can bring things to a nice, tidy conclusion? Yeah. All right, I'll bring it to a tidy conclusion, which is, what about an experiment which could test the retroactive perspective? Here it is. This is, I had experiments in my notes, which were like this, but I stretched it out. So it's a stretched experiment. I hope you can see this. Here we have a beam splitter and a, a laser here. The laser is there, hits the beam splitter, the photon goes either this way or that way. If it goes this way, it hits a lump, starts it moving. If it goes this way, it hits a mirror, and there's a mirror on the lamp which reflects it back. And if they're coherent, it goes straight back here, and the detector, detector over here won't feel anything. Now you see, I have did it here so that the, the beams come back after the lamp has started moving. But it hasn't moved far enough for the state reductions to take place. It moves and moves, and then finally, it does one or the other. Now when it does one or the other, any other model, I think, of state reduction would say, well, it's too late. The photon's already got back here, it's reassembled itself, and there's no way this detector would be activated. But in the retroactive picture, it would go back to, this, this is where the moment of reduction takes place, and it would have to go back to there, and therefore you would have 50% chance of this detector actually receiving the photon. It might be a pretty difficult experiment to do. It's not too far beyond the kind of experiment that Dirk Barmister has been doing to uh, test. It's an experiment in, uh, in my notes. It's, it's one like this here at the bottom where you have um, cavities and so on. I, I won't go into that unless anybody asks me. Um, but it could be done. It's certainly not on the cards yet. Uh, I, I think it should be, experiments should be geared to seeing whether this is possible or not. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Roger. Well done. <laughs> so, over if, if I did, yes. So, let me take a few minutes to, to think about this because I, I, I'd like the audience and just all of us to, to consider and really get our minds around how radical a picture you're proposing, and in the same uh, sentence, also a picture very much in the mainstream of physics. This is an idea we have in the least action principle, for example, that you have to consider the entire trajectory from beginning to end of a, of a particle. So in a sense, there's a teleological aspect to physics already. And I'm wondering if you could just comment almost philosophically or just reflectively on the significance of your retroactive interpretation. Well, it's radically different from all these models. I mean, go back to Newton and uh, Laplace and people who, uh, who worried about, uh, you know, where's free will? Even if you uh, don't know what makes you make your choice or whatever it is. Um, but, well, if it's all predetermined and somebody, I mean, I, I think it was Laplace who made this particular point very strongly that some, somebody could, in principle, or a calculation could exist, which would calculate what everything is going to do once you know the initial state. Um, I've lived with not really not making up my mind about this for a long time. And uh, uh, the Schrodinger equation is completely deterministic. The only place that there could be a, a difference there is in the reduction of the state. Now, uh, as I think was mentioned earlier, uh, there is this point of view that Maybe it is the conscious being that reduces the state. Now, I find this very difficult to swallow, particularly because you could think of an experiment like following. There is a space probe going out to look at a very distant planet, several light years away. It's an Earth-like planet, and so it's got an Earth-like atmosphere on it. And this probe goes out there, and takes several years to go out there, and it sends a signal, which takes quite a long time to get back to an observer looking at the signal. Now it's pro, it's having, it takes a photograph of the atmosphere. Now the atmosphere is, as we know, a, a chaotic system. And people talk about the butterfly effect and things like this. Well, even slight quantum effects are going to change the atmosphere. So you're not going to see you're not, if there is no state reduction, you're not going to see a particular atmosphere, you're going to see a, a miserable superposition of all possible atmospheres. It's just going to be one blur. 
this signal comes back and, and an observer is sitting in front of the screen and finally the signal comes back to him or her of what this uh, space probe is signal. And just at that moment, the consciousness comes in, bloop, it becomes one atmosphere. Does it go all the way back to the signal? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, so I just don't see how people, I mean, I can see why they did because quantum mechanics work so well and people talk about observations and von Neumann was no fuel, no fool. <laughs> he was, many people call him the greatest mathematician of, of the 20th century. I don't think I would say that. I think Hermann Weyl was greater, but never mind. Um, he was a very good mathematician. Roger? Sorry. Uh, how, how does the retroactive view that you've now put forward and developed in the past few months help with the problems that you had identified earlier, for instance, the heating problem. Yes. Well, you see, there is no heating because it comes, the heating comes about because you have these gas molecules starting to move away from each other. So the superposition is now, they start, it's a superposition of the molecules being here and being here. Now, when that happens, the state changes from this to this. That's a big change. Now that will produce a heat or radiation as in this experiment. But in my scheme, what it does is it traces back to where there was very, very little um, change in, in one and the other. So that the two, mo the molecules were in the same place. I mean, you can, you can have a, a, a beam, well, you can, you can have a, well, there's no heating because it goes back to where they, I mean, they just did, I mean there, is, there is no jump. The classical space time evolves continuously, smoothly. And you see, there's the other problem that in the, all these other models where you have a jump there, you violate, well, heating, you violate the conservation of energy. It may be a very, very tiny violation, but that's bad news. It's bad news for general relativity. I suspect that it might be bad news even for celestial dynamics. I, I think the, you can track the motions of planets so accurately now, I mean, you know, the, the motion of the planet Venus was one of the great, uh, the very first great achievement, well, the bending of, I don't know which way you say, because the, the uh, perihelion of Mercury was, was known before, but the, um, I, don't, I don't remember whether, well, calculations, when was that done? I don't know about the history of it very well. But anyway, that, there were two, the, the perihelion of Mercury, Mercury and the bending of light. But the perihelion of Mercury, uh, I mean, the planetary motions were known extraordinarily precise before that, so that you would be able to distinguish Einstein's from Newton's theory. Now, I should have thought that if there was any change of mass of any significance in a planet, which would be really quite large if this state reduction is taking place all the time, that this would have been shown up by now. Now, I'm just guessing whether that's true. So, so Roger, the, if I'm following you, uh, this new view, the retroactive view, maintains the principle of conservation of, of energy, but yes, on yes. pain of just introducing a teleological element to, to our physics. That's correct, yes. But it's a, it's a very slippery kind of tele teleology, which is hard to pin down. You see, I, I have worked hard to make the experiment I mentioned at the end. I had to work hard to think of any experiment where a, a model of the standard kind, I mean, you have an experiment, the first one I had, which I, I uh, it was developed from, was one here, which I considered it, but you see, you consider that the photon might be entangled with the object here. So you lose your coherence because it's entangled. But this is so long afterwards and, and the thing is already cohered. So it took me a while to think of an experiment where you could conceivably see the difference. Well, I say the difference between, well, actually see the retroactivity directly. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. Whereas this particular experiment that I'm putting forward here, it's only in a, in a very uh, primitive form, I think. I mean, uh, there may be one of, some of these experiments using Bose-Einstein condensates that Yvette Fuentes is collaborating with me on. And I think th there's a lot, of, lot more scope there because you, there are a lot of flexibility. But how you do this experiment with them, I, I don't know yet. The Barmista one is a little closer to that. You could modify it by putting some more cavities in. You, you put a couple more cavities. You, in his one, you have uh, one, one cavity. Uh, one cavity here, one cavity here, and you put right. another one. Uh, you, 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 in principle, do it. 
So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this idea develops and the paper, you've already shown me a draft of a paper that's something like 80 pages long. So I'm curious. I'm going to um, have to use that. Yes. Right. So let me try to broaden the discussion a little bit. Um, the, by the way, audience members, the organizers have allowed us to go a little bit long on this session uh, just to make sure we get some of your questions in. But using my prerogative as, as a chair for, the, for a moment, I wanted to ask Stuart if you could just bring us quickly up to speed on the status of uh, empirically testing and intercomparing the different theories, o ORC OR, IIT. I know you've got a whole initiative to try to bring some kind of sense to all this, this zoo of theories. And where does that stand now? Well, Templeton has the project, the Accelerating Research and Consciousness, Templeton World Charity Foundation. And uh, we initially attempted a uh, uh, adversarial collaboration with IIT, but we couldn't come to an agreement. And uh, uh, we're, we're uh, Templeton agreed to fund our uh, attempts to falsify ORC OR without uh, bringing IIT uh, into the mix. I personally don't see how IIT is testable or falsifiable. I know that they are, they're in a project with uh, Global Neuronal Workspace something about if the MRI is active in the back of the brain, IIT uh, wins. If it's in the front of the brain, global workspace wins. But I've seen studies uh, where the activity supposedly correlating with consciousness is sometimes in the front, like with the executive actions, or if you're just watching a film mindlessly, it's in the back of the brain. So I think consciousness can be in the, first of all, we don't know that MRI uh, correlates with consciousness, it's blood flow. And there are examples where we know it, they, they don't correlate. Uh, so I don't see how uh, uh, activity, bold activity in the front or the back will prove or disprove IIT. I don't think it's, it's testable or falsifiable. I actually don't think it has any, it, it's very general. It applies some uh, uh, nonlinear, I'm not, not even sure what it is. When I heard, first heard about phi, I thought, ah, oh, the golden mean, that's cool. Fibonacci, microtubules, interesting. It's not that, it's something else and I still don't know what it is after all these years. I also have to say that I spent a lot of years with a nonlinear dynamicist, very good friend of mine, Alwyn Scott, who wrote Stairway to the Mind and started the CNLS at Los Alamos and went to a lot of chaos meetings up there and whatnot and tried to apply nonlinear dynamics to consciousness and microtubule activities and it just didn't seem to do anything for it. And then uh, I read Roger's book and met Roger and decided the quantum approach was much better. So um, uh, IIT's main, main claim to fame seems to be that they explain that the, uh, the way the cerebellum is wired up, uh, it doesn't have enough phi, which is why the cerebellum isn't conscious, but the cerebellum doesn't have pyramidal cells. I think uh, consciousness occurs in pyramidal cells primarily. It can uh, occur in any um, microtubule uh, bearing uh, material or, or anything else really, if it's proto-conscious, um, but uh, uh, you don't need to invoke the, you know, how the cerebellum's wired up if, if, if you need uh, uh, pyramidal cells. So um, uh, for a while, um, uh, they were trying to say that uh, if we could show uh, quantum vibrations in microtubules, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, IIT would, phi would apply to that. And I said, okay, well, let's do it. And then we'll see which, uh, which applies better, uh, ORC OR or IIT. And then they backed out. They didn't, they, I called their bluff and they didn't go for it. So uh, we're going on our own. We have funding to do, uh, and I'm not involved in the experiments. Roger's not involved. It's being done by experts who are basically neutral. Uh, in fact, uh, some of them are, are, are skeptical uh, of, of what we say. So we'll see. And we're, you know, I, as I said in the title of my talk, uh, it would be very easy to falsify work OR at least ORC by showing that there's no, none of these quantum vibrations in the microtubules as our, mo as our computer modeling study uh, showed. Basically, we're trying to do that computer modeling sh that I, I had a blitz through too fast, uh, do it experimentally to find these quantum vibrations in microtubules in the terahertz. And if they're there at room temperature or biological temperature, then see if they go away with anesthesia proportional to the anesthetic potency. I think that would be a very strong uh, claim, certainly stronger than any other theory of consciousness yet proposed, but I have no idea how to disprove IIT. Great, so looking at some of the questions that are coming in, there's actually a common theme has developed in a few of the questions between your talk and Peter and Hartman's talk, and maybe actually I'll pose this question to Peter and Hartman, therefore. 
and that is the the role that you're giving to pleasure seeking as opposed to other uh, evolutionary ad adaptive advantages, for example, or subjectivity. So can you flesh out a little bit why you give pleasure this central role? Peter, uh, Hartman or me? Uh, um, maybe, maybe Hartman and then Peter can chime in and then Stu, you too. Yeah, so we definitely didn't want to propose a pure pleasure-seeking <laughs> robot. Um, it's actually both ways, um, what pleasure and displeasure. Um, or we meant to say it is a good place to start. Um, when you try to reconcile the first-person perspective and third-person perspective, as I said, it's a good place to start where these perspectives are correlated. And it seems like... Um, may you follow Antonio Damasio's work, um, who points this out uh, very eloquently, that feelings are basically about checking in how the homeostasis is doing. And if your homeostasis is doing well, then you seem to be in a good um, state, it feels good. And if your homeostasis is uh, threatened or becoming unstable, then it feels unpleasant. So it's this correlation. It's not just about pleasure, it's about uh, both signs. Peter, did you want to chime in as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, inevitably, I suppose, as an investor, I look at this with a, a slightly more commercial angle. So for me, um, you know, trying to sort of tease that out. And I think what's interesting for me is the where we got to right at the end, which is what happens when you integrate this homeostatic engine that works in the way that Hartman just describes with a learner. And because I think that is where I see commercial application for this. It, as, as we said, it has, um, it has ethical questions uh, that would need to be navigated very carefully. But I think it's a really interesting uh, you know, point to leave the audience with, which is, would you, you know, would you rather have the best AI? And we think that one integrated with a homeostatic engine is that, or would you want to have one that you can control? And I think that's a really kind of a nuanced ethical question, but it's also, um, you know, highly commercially relevant to a lot of the work that's being done in AI right now. So Stuart, do you see this tying into your own, that big paper you did a few years ago on pleasure seeking as an essential evolutionary driver? Yeah, I've never been uh, totally happy with the idea of, of evolution. Oh, uh, Stuart, can you turn up your uh, volume? Turn it what? Oh, there. Now I can hear you. I've never been totally happy with the idea of uh, evolution and uh, gene survival. That 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 everything we do is to promote our genes. Uh, if you look, any organism in a lab, uh, on up to us humans, uh, acts uh, to optimize pleasure in some way. Certainly, reward in a, in a in in rats or any experiment you want to do, and then we learn to you know uh, delay our gratification. And it's not all hedonism or pleasure, but basically we're here now to because we're pursuing our profession and we enjoy it. And in some way, we're getting we're getting some pleasure out of it or some gratification. So all we do, you know, it, it doesn't need to be hedonistic. It could be altruistic. It could be spiritual. It could be, uh, you know, it, it's better to give than to receive. So I, I, it's not a hedonistic approach, but it, it certainly I think it certainly started out that way. And when I realized that Roger's objective reduction with these organic molecules uh, could have, could have, uh, did, should have preceded the origin of life, you know, uh, and the origin of life is still somewhat of a mystery, still a mystery. And uh, if it was, uh, you know, simple pleasure or avoidance of displeasure could have been the spark, sparks uh, that originated life and just kept on going as the motivation for the uh, development and assembly of organisms into more and more complex uh, entities to optimize pleasure in various ways. So um, I like the uh, the quantum pleasure principle idea, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know I, I'm I'm kind have of, kind of uh, uh, become used to being uh, an outlier in in science uh, in many ways. So you know let's just add evolution to the mix. But um, and I'm not sure how Roger feels about that. So I, I, he certainly. I mean, I'm using his ideas of OR in the in the uh, you know early or mid universe uh, uh, to to promote uh, life and evolution. But um, 
it, it's logical to me. It makes a lot more sense than uh, gene survival. And you know, genes don't feel or think, as far as we know. If they do, then then maybe that's another case. But uh, uh, I think it's all about optimizing uh, pleasure and avoiding displeasure. Wonderful. Thanks. So, Ani, are you are you there? You've dropped off my screen here, but we do have a number of audience questions for you. I hope he hasn't gone to bed. I know it's in the middle of the night for him. <laughs> Sleep, maybe. So, Ani, if you come back in, I will, I will pose these questions. People are dying to know more about quantum cloaking. Um, going back to, um, to Peter and, and Hartman, a question came in about, well, essentially asking how this works in collective systems, how, for instance, what, whether markets could actually exhibit some of these feelings or, or feedback loops that you're describing, homeostatic feedback loops you're describing. Is, is this applied to biological organisms and AI systems, or is it a more general feature of the world, the kind of approach you're taking? Peter? <laughs> Sorry, go for a moment. Yeah, maybe um, you know, I, I gave sort of this um, explanation of why we think a conscious experience is a limited observable. It's observable strictly in the Gedanken experiment of two clones. Um, and I have always thought, okay, between us and the robot, the um, the, on animat this gulf is too big we are too different even though we can think of this cheesy move of giving it self-reporting abilities via word embeddings but i always thought if there would be a society of um, or multiple animats that could interact with each other then for them they become observable their conscious state um, becomes observable relative to each other and can we exploit this somehow? Um, but I have to admit, I never got this to work as of now. So yeah, it would be very interesting to think of this animat we proposed in a group setting. So you have multiple AIs interacting with each other. What happens then? Um, but as of today, I don't have a good answer for that. I would just add that I think the, the principle that we were trying to embody there was um, the, the well-known um, it, it, it takes one to know one, uh, which we thought, you know, was, was an interesting place to start. And, and we actually sort of felt that that was much easier to model between, I mean, the model we had in our minds was a, you know, a parent and child, uh, you know, very often the expression on a child's face will tell a parent quite a lot about what that child, the, the conscious experience that, that child is having. Um, so I think we were uh, we were thinking in a, very, in a, in a relatively limited, uh, you know, one-to-one -one rather than uh, many-to-many. -many. Very good, thanks. So, Roger, the top trending question on the Q&A session right now actually goes back to some of the Emperor's uh, New Mind <laughs> arguments about uh, yeah. kind of a Gödelian argument. Yes. And the question is whether the same <laughs> Gödelian restriction on logical mathematical systems also applies to science as a whole, whether science as a whole is somehow restricted or its methods are restricted in this kind of self-referential way. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know of any theorem to do with that. I mean, the thing about the Gödel theorem is it's a theorem. <laughs> and it really does show you that uh, we don't, uh, well, I mean, people don't think about it this way, but, but it's, I mean, people, I thought, I'm glad to hear people still worrying about it because <laughs> um, it's, it's something which you can't explain simply by an AI system, as far as I can see. I mean, um, it's the question of understanding. I always like to phrase it that way, that what it is that, I mean, consciousness does all sorts of things. I mean, clearly, I mean, people talk about pain and pleasure and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, uh, but the main thing that I could say anything about I mean, I can't quite see why you could say something enjoys itself and, and uh, worry about whether you can make a theory out of that. But, but what you can say is understanding of mathematical truth. Now, you may say it's a very limited activity, but if in that limited activity, you could see that there is something non-computational going on, then it seems to me that's a serious argument, even though uh, 
well, I've been worried about the people have forgotten the argument, but the argument is 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 pretty strong, um, especially in the, in the context of evolution. I mean, you you could see that okay, the Gödel theorem is pretty sophisticated, or the Goodstein theorem, which I often give in talks, is. Uh, I mean, you can understand what the theorem is. And you can even see sort of why it's true for the number four, for example. But how is it that the understanding that this thing is true came about when it's so far from, from natural selection f phenomena? So it obviously was not specifically selected for. That is to say, an algorithm for doing very sophisticated mathematics was not naturally selected for. What was naturally selected for was the general quality of understanding. And that's the ability, if you like, to stand back and think about what you were thinking about and things like that. I mean, Gödel's theorem is very much that sort of a thing. You stand back and think about what you were thinking about. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly, you were trying to think about what somebody else would think about something. And you can see in behavior, I mean, one of the examples I would like to quote is this, the, the African hunting dogs and how they are, they, you can see them dividing themselves into two groups. One group go and hide just where the, the pass over the, the river has to be, and the other one go and chase the antelopes there, and then they pounce on them. I mean, they must have com been communicating with themselves in some way to work out that strategy. Okay, that's not solving the <laughs> girdle problem or something, but that's understanding of some kind. And that, I can well believe, goes way, way down in, 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 in the animal kingdom, not just humans. And that quality, okay, it's been developed very greatly in, in human thinking, and sure, but it's something which has been there a long time and it has been naturally selected for. And what consciousness is doing in this particular respect is giving us the quality of understanding. That does other things too. Um, Do you think that the difficulties we have in science, at least in theoretical physics, of mm -hmm. understanding the measurement problem or other great questions of our age? The question is beyond this, I suppose. That was, I, I rather lost the question in rambling in my way. No, the, yeah, the question is, is there some limit to our understanding in some sense of physics? I don't quite see where there should be. And I don't know of any sort of Gödel type theorem that says you can't have that. Okay, you can't have a theory which tells us what I'm going to do next and then I'll do something else. I mean, sure, yeah, you have that kind of limitation. So it can't be a theory where you could, um, make a computer work out what I'm going to do in 10 minutes and tell me what the answer is before 10 minutes. And that's how damn well not going to do it. So you can see you've got, you, you've got to evolve, avoid that kind of paradox. And clearly you've got to avoid that kind of paradox with the retroactive scheme, which I'm putting forward. So, so that's absolutely clear. So um, uh, that's the thing which is, but it's not the same as I think the question was worrying about whether a limit ultimately to the, to the development of physics. I don't see why there should be. It may be, you know, too complicated to work things out or it may be difficult in other, some other sense to work it out. But I don't see why in principle one shouldn't get to the root of it all. We're not there yet, no way from it. But. Well, those of us trained in physics will be relieved to hear that because that's as much <laughs> our life's work is. Yes. So, Stuart, there's been a couple questions that um, actually there's been a number of questions about some of the nitty gritty of orco arm microtubules. But let me just pick one of them as a representative question, which is memory. So can you elaborate for a couple minutes on how memory works? Because this is I think you're proposing, if I'm following, a pretty radical shift in neuroscience of memory. Yes, uh, the, the uh, standard idea is synaptic plasticity, synaptic strength. You have a neural network and the strengths of particular synapses in the network will channel information activity through the network in a particular way. And synaptic strengths and uh, the famous long-term potentiation experiments, uh, Bliss and O'Keefe and, and those guys um, uh, uh, showed that uh, a high frequency uh, input causes a prolonged uh, sensitization of that synapse uh, and uh, Donald Hebb and, and all that. So that's that's pretty standard dogma. The problem with that is that the membrane proteins at the synapses, the uh, both on the postsynaptic side, the receptors and the and the GTP uh, cyclic uh, uh, G proteins and all that, and on the uh, release side, uh, are transient and only last hours to days and uh, memories can last lifetimes. So these proteins have to be replenished. And how are they replenished? Well, by the microtubules 
uh, with the motor proteins carrying those things along as I showed in one of those early slides. Um, so um, the microtubules are involved in, in memory, but most people would still say it's in the synaptic strength, uh, but that's too short. Now, what we showed in our paper uh, with the CAMK2, Travis, uh, Craddock, Jack Jasinski, and I, was that CAMK2, which is uh, uh, not well understood, this hexagonal enzyme, and it is involved in memory, can imprint up to six bits of information per CAMK2. And with every synaptic influx, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of these CAMK2s that spread all over the, the neuron, the, the dendrite uh, tree, dendritic tree. So, uh, and the phosphorylation fits. So, um, it, I think it's a, it's a valid mechanism. And uh, um, uh, we get a lot of hits on our, our paper, but it hasn't made a dent in neuroscience uh, because everybody's so entrenched. Uh, just like everybody's so entrenched in neurons being the fundamental units of information processing in the brain, and we know that can't be right. But when you think about a single cell, like a paramecium or even an amoeba that can solve problems, a paramecium swims around, finds a mate, can learn all these things. It doesn't have any, it's not part of a network, it's one cell. All Those creatures use their microtubules. So would our microtubules be sitting around acting as bony skeletal support and not taking advantage of their information processing abilities? I don't think so. And we need the, we need the capacity for memory storage. And uh, each tubulin can be uh, modified in so many different ways, post-translational modifications, phosphorylation, uh, binding of, uh, of uh, various things, so that each tubulin can have, let's just say, 10 states. So you've got 10 to the ninth raised to the 10th power of possible states per neuron. So the capacity of memory storage uh, at that level is enormous. Then the problem is, well, how does it relate globally? And so you need entanglement, you need something quantum so that memory is distributed. And we know memory is distributed anyway through Lashley and Prebum and so forth. So um, I think it's a logical uh, proposal. Uh, I'm somewhat dismayed that it hasn't been picked up on because uh, memory is still a mystery. And uh, the whole thing with Alzheimer's and, and memory loss, uh, sh people should be looking at the microtubules. And uh, in fact, we've proposed using ultrasound. Ultrasound, uh, uh, this study yesterday, and uh, Sasha Bostritsky mentioned a couple of different mechanisms. He said, well, Stuart has his own ideas. Well, my idea is that the ultrasound acts on microtubules because they have megahertz uh, vibrational frequencies. And we actually have some preliminary data on that we've, we've never uh, published. And, uh, but um, I, I think uh, that's a way of addressing memory issues in Alzheimer's and, and other uh, neurological disorders is, is by approaching the microtubules, not just working on receptors that act on uh, membrane proteins. Wonderful, thank you. So um, part, but we've had a few questions that are in a very much like, tell me about X uh, perspective. So let me kind of pack those together. Can you give us just a quick rundown of where some of your experiments, to the extent you can tell us where your experiments in progress stand? What's the next milestone we can look forward to now that supremacy has been achieved? Just a quick status report. <laughs> yeah, so this would, my day job, I should say, is um, not about uh, building a conscious or feeling animates. <laughs> my day job is um, concerned with building a large error-corrected quantum computer and finding scientifically or commercially relevant applications for it. And um, for those who are interested, um, we host an um, annual event, it's called the Quantum Summer Symposium. And the uh, video of the talks just went online. So there is actually a half hour talk if somebody wants to know what, where does the Quantum AI Lab at Google stand today and uh, what is our roadmap going forward. There's a talk that people can look at, um, but I can maybe highlight um, where we want to go. So we indeed um, spent significant time fleshing out um, a roadmap. And the anchor points are, we believe it will take us about 10 years. We joke it will be before the end of the decade, <laughs> to allude to this Kennedy quote, that we have uh, this error-corrected machine um, ready. And there's a, a sequence of technical milestones leading up to it. Our next technical milestone is to demonstrate that quantum error correction can work in principle. It has never been shown that um, let's say you build a little grid of qubits, let's say three by three uh, qubits or five by five qubits, and then you surround them with these measure qubits that do the roundabout parity measurements that I uh, talked about. 
So what you need to see is if I have, let's say a five by five grid of data qubits relative to a three by three grid, then the logical error rate needs to come down. This has never been shown and this is our next milestone. So we hope um, to demonstrate uh, that. And then, yeah, there's more milestones and leading up um, all the way to the one million machine, but I stop here. Can I, can I just add, George, to, to that? Again, again, from a, a layman or a, or a more sort of commercial um, perspective, I, I said during our talk, you know, what excites me about what uh, Hartman and his team are building there are these machines that um, solve problems the way nature solves problems. We would call it biomimicry, I guess. And um, in the, the commercial, the, the most likely commercial applications of that could potentially be in things like um, quantum chemistry. Um, and, you know, for me, if we're starting to be able to build artificial trees that take uh, carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into oxygen, that feels to me like a, you know, a good thing for humanity, obviously, and a, you know, a proper commercial application of relatively, um, uh, you know, early generation um, quantum machines. Wonderful, thank you. So, um, Roger, you have a couple of hundred audience members out here. I don't know what the latest count, 198 online. <laughs> and maybe 197 of them are still trying to get their minds, including myself, around the retroactive ideas yeah. that you have. So one question came up that may help us zero in on this is whether it would help understand the delayed choice experiment or some of these other experiments, quantum steering, uh, into the past that might, how does your view bear on those, those classic experiments? Well, I'd forgotten them when I was, <laughs> no, I don't think really, because I, I don't think the multiple delayed choice, is that what you were referring to? There was a thing called That's the right. delayed yes. a Wheeler type of experiment, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, don't, I never could quite see why that was a problem, <laughs> but maybe because the, the choice is made it's not made earlier. I think it was a way of looking at quantum mechanics, which isn't mine, but I'd have to be reminded what it is again, because I, I remember thinking that I didn't quite see why it was a problem. Um, it's it's to, to do whether something is a position state or, or is it is it an interference thing? And, and you... I think the idea is that between the state preparation, so after state preparation, but before measurement, yeah, sure. the decision is made that slits are opened or closed, for example, they're not. So, yeah. Clearly, the state preparation can't be responsible then for what the output is. That's right. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, the state is something or other, um, and whether you choose to close the state. I mean, suppose it, there's a photon coming along and it doesn't know whether you've chosen to open the slit or not. Well, that photon has a state which is spread out. It's not localized. Sure. So only part of it goes through the slit. So a lot of it gets lost. But the part which goes through the slit is localized there. It's not as though it's decided beforehand that it's going to go through the slit or something. I didn't quite under. I think I never quite got the hang of the of what the problem was. Um, let, let me um, then channel <laughs> the, the 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 audience member's question in a slightly different direction. There have been other proposals yeah. by Ken Wharton, Hugh Price, and others for a retrocausal interpretation of mm -hmm. a Bell experiment that the correlation might reflect a backward in time. Yes, or John, uh, John Kramer. Ruth Kastner. Higher enough. Uh, yeah, Yakir did that kind of thing. Does your view uh, relate to that? I try, well, you see, when I was running my notes, I was perfectly well. I was going to put Aronoff's and all that stuff into, into the model and thinking of it sort of, and then I realized it was different. As far as I can see, I mean, they have two a forward propagating and a backward propagating wave function. And so that when you, you have a measurement here and then a measurement here, I'm, here and here means in time, earlier and then later. And this measurement re reduces the wave function to, to a reduced state here. But then there's a corresponding wave function which is reduced by the later measurement and they come back. And it's quite useful to consider those two wave functions together because you can look at scalar products and so on. And there are these Weidmann uh, experiments um, which are very complicated and you have little things going on in the middle and so on. It, it helps you to understand some of those um, situations. I don't think it's the same thing, is what I'm saying. 
because they tend not to be i don't know what a Haranov's view is on on the reduction of the state i know i've talked to him about it but i can't, I can't uh um lev weidman i've talked to certainly about this well they, they tend to be many worlds type of view well for me a key message though is independent of the specifics that yeah. Your proposal, which will strike a lot of people as just crazy. Oh yeah, it has to be crazy. But, <laughs> but it's very much in keeping. It's 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 something a lot of people have thought about, and it's yes. not crazy. It's really it's just objectively not a crazy idea, and I'm very excited to see how you develop it. When I say it's crazy, I mean it's it's unlike our current thinking. Well, you see, my cosmological model is crazy too, but then we seem to see confirmations of that. Um, this is crazier, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just when I say it's crazy, I mean, you know, quantum mechanics is crazy. <laughs> Even the Earth moving around the sun is probably pretty crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's crazy, it's just unfamiliarity, I suppose. Yes, I'm going to get used to the idea. I mean, even that, yeah, that the Earth is rotating and not the sun moving around it is pretty crazy. Because you can okay, see it. So I need yeah. to give the final, final word to... To, to <laughs> Roger's credit, I would say it's... Oh experimentally testable and hence it's oh, science. Yes, yes. You know, that just, and that's what excites me about OCRR in general, that yes. we, it can be tested. It's, it's not just floating off in the unempirical clouds. But certainly the retroactive, as the, the last experiment I, I mentioned rather quickly, in some form is, is testable. I mean, if that's certainly in theory testable, whether you could make it a practical one. I think it probably is not so far from the Barmister experiment. But you just put a few more cavities in the experiment. It'd probably take another <laughs> five years to do it or something. But I can't quite see why you couldn't modify it to, to, to test it in this way. Whether you could do make Bose Einstein condensates, that's really exciting. I'd, I'd like to think more about those um, because they're much more flexible, you see. You can do all sorts of things. Um, so, Stuart, um, I'm passing the, the baton to you. I understand that you have an announcement to make for the group and then we can all break and go get some lunch or dinner or whatever it is in our time zone. Well, th thank you, George. And I'll hand it back to you. And I, I basically wanted to thank you and the other uh, uh, speakers. I thought this was a great session. Uh, this is my last uh, time uh, on screen uh, for this conference. So I want to thank all the speakers, all the participants. I want to particularly thank uh, the guys from Commotion Studios who handle our AV and tech stuff. And I want to thank uh, Abby Behar Montefiore, who is Wonder Woman. And uh, she and Commotion, uh, uh, I gave them, in retrospect, unreasonable expectations. Uh, and yet they uh, pretty much, they met them. We've had a few glitches, but uh, generally it's run uh, very well. And thanks especially to Abby. She's always trustworthy. She's always reliable. She always comes through. And the same can be said of Commotion. So thanks to all. And I'll send it back to you to say goodbye. And thanks. Good seeing all my friends out there. Good seeing you.